Welcome to Edinburgh Culture Conversations. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Janet Archer. I'm the Director of Festival, Cultural and City Events at the University of Edinburgh and I'm your host for this evening. This is the final event in the series. All of the previous events have been uploaded to our website if you want to watch them and we'd be really interested in your feedback. You can email us on festivals at ed.ac.uk. So, a few thanks before we begin. First of all, thank you to the Edinburgh Futures Institute, who are our partners for this event. EFI is all about bringing people together to solve global challenges and build a sustainable future. Vitally important before COVID, but even more essential now. I'm delighted that Leslie Makara, Director of the Edinburgh Futures Institute, is with us today. Thank you too to everyone at the university who's helped make this series happen, the Festival Cultural and City Events Team, and everyone at EFI, communications and marketing, as well as community engagement and events and protocol who've worked with us to promote these events. And a special thank you to the artists, creatives, academics and cultural leaders who've contributed as panelists across the series. We've had 58 contributors over the course of this series, an incredible powerhouse of thought, ideas and knowledge, whose words have inspired people across the world over the course of the last 10 weeks. And thank you too to Donna Jewell and Greg Calhoun from Just Sign, our BSL interpreters. This series is taking place against the backdrop of the world's biggest festival city, successful because of its extraordinary community of festivals, large and small. 2020 is the first year since 1947 that the spring and summer festivals haven't been able to take place. It's felt important to mark this moment and capture how the arts and creative sectors are helping society recover from the effects of COVID-19. It's also felt important to reflect on the profound impact that COVID's had on the arts. The OECD, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, last week published its policy responses to coronavirus in a report, Culture Shock, COVID-19 and the Cultural and Creative Sectors. It presents a stark picture of impact, citing that the cultural and creative sectors are amongst the hardest hit by the pandemic, with large cities often containing the greatest share of jobs at risk. It accounts for the importance of the cultural and creative sectors in terms of their economic footprint and employment and highlights the role they play in spurring innovation across the economy. It also highlights their powerful contribution to numerous other channels for positive social impact, including well-being and health, education, inclusion and urban regeneration. Underpinning all of this, I think, is the fact that the arts bring beauty and meaning into our lives, which has been a thread right through Edinburgh Culture Conversations since we began our series in July. Despite the festivals not being able to present live work this year, people from around the world have at least been able to engage through an impressive range of online work. Whilst it's definitely not been the same as the live experience, audience numbers have been significant and there is much to build on. The Edinburgh Futures Institute supported a number of groundbreaking projects this summer. The Space and Satellites Data Artist Residencies from May to June teamed artists with researchers to tell stories through data and climate change to the impact that the coronavirus has had on our cities. Five artists, Victoria Evans, Cecile Simonis, Julia McGee, Stacey Hunter and Elaine Ford were selected from 35 international applications to take part in these data-driven innovation funded collaborations between science and creative practice. EFI has also commissioned artworks by Anna Riddler and Caroline Sinders and Jake Elwes, which will launch on the Edinburgh International Fe Festival's platform in October. This programme has been curated by Chancellor's Fellow Drew Hemond and explores the boundary between the real and the artificial. The work will be launched on 17th of October and available to view until 30th of November this year. And EFI is partnering with the International Festival on Morning Manifesto podcast, which we'll hopefully hear a little bit more about later on from David Gregg, who last year worked with Sarah Shirawi and 15 writers from across the world to collectively co-author a manifesto for the future as a love song to our shared humanity. In this vein, today's conversation focuses on culture and futures. The Edinburgh Futures Institute's multidisciplinary approach is about bringing people together to deliver solutions in an uncertain world. Our panel, in dialogue with EFI director Leslie Makara, will vision how the arts and creativity can contribute towards a sustainable future. Before I introduce 
the panel, or before I ask the panel to introduce themselves, I should say, I want to flag a couple of housekeeping points. I'd like to ask you to save your questions until about halfway through. I'll do my best to take as many as possible, but I'm sure I won't get them all in, so please forgive me if we don't manage to answer your question. To ask a question, use the Zoom Q&A function. You'll find it at the bottom of your screen. We're recording the event, so please take that into account in answering questions. And if you want to tweet, use the hashtag UOE Culture Conversations. That's UOE Culture Conversations. And be aware that the university's approach to ethics means that we're guided by the principles of dignity, respect for others, integrity, objectivity and openness. I'd ask you to present questions in this context and we'll reserve the right to remove any questions if they don't fit in with this. So now I'd like to welcome my guests for this evening. And as I said, I'm going to ask each of them to say a few words about themselves. And I'm going to start with David, David Gregg. Thank you. Uh, I'm David Gregg. I'm the um, Artistic Director of the Royal Lyceum Theatre here in Edinburgh. It's a 650 seat um, Victorian proscenium arch theatre, a very, very beautiful theatre. Unfortunately, we've not been able to open during the period of COVID, although we do hope we might be able to open in a very small scale over the coming weeks. Um, before I became Artistic Director of the Lyceum, I was a playwright and I've been working as a playwright in Scotland for some uh, 30 years um, with plays being produced um, <clears throat> in various places around the world. Thank you, David. I'm going to move us on to Suki, Suki Johal. Ah, so Suki's internet. Hi, Hi Janet, and uh, Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. I'm Suki Johal. I'm the director for the Centre of Culture and Creativity at the University of Lincoln. Uh, we kind of think of ourselves as a think and do tank. So our interest in the centre is in the interplay with academia in practice, in policy, in people and in places. So we like to play a kind of interdisciplinary role and just kind of stimulate discussions between the sector, civic society and, and academia. I'm also the chair of the Arts Council for the Midlands area and on National Council, which I, I'd say is quite surprising to me, even two years in, because I've been relatively outspoken on a number of things. So it's good to see that uh, those voices are allowed into the tent. I have uh, 12 years of experience in local government and also worked uh, running a national DCMS agency for about six years so I, I'm kind of across the arts and cultural sector for almost now 30 years which uh, is far too long. Suki, just so you know we can hear you but we can't see you at the moment um, so hopefully we'll uh, be able to sort. Janet, I, it, it's stronger, I can hear the signal much stronger if I'm, if I'm kind of offline um, on the visuals but hopefully you can hear me clearly enough. Okay, we can, we can indeed. I'm going to move us on to Leslie Makara, the Director of Edinburgh Futures Institute. Well, thank you, and thank you very much for inviting me to participate today. Um, I am the Director of the Edinburgh Futures Institute. Um, I think this is a really exciting innovation that the University is pursuing just now, investing heavily in it, but multidisciplinarity is about co-production, genuinely democratic ways of engaging with communities, with industry, with government, and it's all going to be done in the uh, the Old Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, so there's going to be a building project associated with this as well, a symbiotic relationship between this vision and the building. So I think that's that's a very exciting proposition. I'm also a criminologist. My day job is a criminologist. I research crime, justice and social order, which are three themes that are vitally important today in terms of the COVID regeneration. And, and I have myself been in government in my early career, um, so I also have a sort of policy interest as well. So that's me. Thank you, Leslie. I'm going to move us on to Sarah Munro, who's with us from Gateshead in the northeast of England. Hi, it's great to, to join. Um, I'm Sarah Munro, director. I've been here almost uh, next month, I think it's five years since I arrived in Gateshead from Glasgow, where I was formerly head of arts and um, primarily really for eight years before that was really leading the, the tramway arts centre on the south side of Glasgow. So Baltic is uh, extremely large. We have about 10,000 square metres of exhibition space. We have no collection, so we're a producing house. Um, and we're really, the, I think we're probably in square meterage with the largest contemporary art space in the UK. And we're also um, very much embedded to have a very strong relationship with our local 
constituents and local audiences. So I've been really leading over the last five years like a refocusing of our um, mission really into being much more based around the civic um, capacity and ability of what we can do rather than it being one of uh, an economic impact narrative, which I'm much less interested in. Thank you, Sarah. And moving on to Amanda Parker, who's with us from London. Hello, um, I'm Amanda Parker. I have lots of different hats. I am director of INCARTS, which champions for the creative, economic and contractual rights of the ethnically diverse art sector workforce which means in practical terms, working with the cultural leaders, ethnically diverse cultural leaders working across heritage, music, theatre, and the workforce itself, uh, lobbying and doing lots of data sets of research. Uh, that's one job. I also edit Arts Professional, which is the, one of the sector's publications for news and views and features. I am the director for London Short Film Festival. Thankfully, that's quite a small slice of my week. And my side hustle is as a model, which gives me a very interesting insight into the very commercial end of arts and cultural creativity. Um, I'm on the board of Film London. I chair Arts Depot, which is a arts organization in North London and I'm on the Shadow Task Force for the Arts and the Cultural Strategy Group for London. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Wow, that's very impressive, Amanda. Thank you very much. And last but not least, moving on to Geoffrey Sharkey, uh, who's with us from Glasgow. Thanks, Janet. Um, it's a pleasure and honor to be with all of you on this important panel. Um, I'm Jeff Sharkey. I, um, moved over from the United States in 2013, having, um, 2014, having lived in England before that and worked in both countries, seeing interesting challenges in the way the arts are funded and taught um, and supported. And there's something special about Europe and its community focus on the arts. And for me as a musician, a different way of breathing the phrase, which made me very much excited to come to Scotland, where I'm principal of the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland, and that spans pretty much most of the performing arts. Um, if it takes place over time, we, we tend to do it. So we have classical music, jazz, uh, traditional musics. Uh, we teach drama, dance, production, and film, uh, and contemporary performance, and are very interested in the spaces in between the arts, in breaking down some of the labels and some of the things that have kept artists apart and learning divergently from one another, which I think is one of the future's ideas I might touch upon later. Brilliant. And did I read somewhere that the Royal Conservatory of Scotland is in the top 10 performing arts schools in the world? In, we've been in that for four out of the last five years. And when that first happened, I think Glaswegians said, what? Mm -hmm. um, and now they, they're, they're kind of excited that that's the case. There's some amazing sharing of art that I think Scotland is so good at it just encourages wherever you're from to say I like that idea I might run with that and add something to it and make something completely different and it's I think it's unique and something for Scotland to be proud of. Brilliant so we're going to move on to our questions um, and I'm going to ask David to answer the first one um, and it's a big question uh, and I think it's the question that you know in a way we we we've all been striving to find the answer to uh, for that elevator pitch um, when we need to really nail it. But David, in your view, why do the arts matter? How important is culture and creativity in today's world? Um, well, I think I would say that it's fundamental to being human. I mean, I would just draw perhaps a distinction between culture and creativity. I think there's a sense in which there's two elements to the arts. There's cult if we look at culture as being... Um, that which we inherit, that which shapes us, that which um, we, we are given almost as a birthright, or we ought to be given as a birthright by the society in which we're brought up. And within that, you can see tradition, you can see the carrying stream of the work that is handed to you, the, the dances, the music, the singing, the plays, the novels, whatever it might be. And it may take many forms wherever you happen to uh, be in the world. <clears throat> And then there's creativity, which is our own engagement 
with our own uh, world and with those with that inheritance um, and that's a that's a place of personality and it's a place um, of uh, uh, it's it's a place where you don't have to necessarily follow rules uh, and where you can you know find a bit of space and <clears throat> I suppose the first thing I would say is I've been reading a lot recently about very ancient humans and about the way in which there's a very strong suggestion that essentially the entirety of our brain formation is about culture that the hippocampus is a sort of um, the way that we literally move through the world uh, the way our brain connections are forged is exists because um, because culture was the means by which you could literally make your way through the world it was it was you had to be enculturated in order to be in order to be safely human so on one level something like a song is just a song but on another level um, for a hundred thousand years of human history it may have been a means by which you were um, able to belong able to participate able to share able to find your way through a forest able to um, communicate with somebody else able to carry within you all kinds of varieties and that's the other thing about culture it carries layers and layers and layers um, of of meaning it's not simply one thing it never is and then the creativity I'm drawn to I, there's a piece of work I saw I've never forgotten in the um, exhibition of Bronze Age no not sorry of, 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 of Stone Age art I think it's called at the British Museum it was art from 10,000 years ago it's one of my favorite exhibitions ever it was all found objects and there were these little stones that had been found in a kind of riverbed um, and I think they were 10, 15, 20,000 years old, something before written time, written history. And they were little, they had little sort of uh, carvings to make them into little faces. And the way that the curator had set it up said, you know, this is probably some people beside a river just mucking about. Basically, they just found a stone and said, oh, look, this looks like Brenda. Look, if you do a sort of you put a smile on it look it's Brendan and then they popped it down on the shelf and maybe done another one and maybe it was just one person doing it and I I've always imagined that picture of in my head it's always some women by the river for whatever reason and they're just having a laugh and then she was putting these stones up and I always think of that when I think of the kind of, of creativity so culture is the kind of um, is one side and creativity is our own our own way of engaging with the world and with what we're given um, so I don't know that that's an elevator pitch necessarily, but what I would say is it's, it is literally us. There is no other us outside of culture and creativity. Now, then you might say, what's an elevator pitch for the arts? I think that's very often means funding. And I, I, I'm, I'm interested in those discussions. We can have those discussions, but I would start on the point that we aren't fully, we are not fully allowing ourselves and our fellow citizens to be fully human if we're not fully allow us allowing ourselves to engage both with some form of shared culture or cultures and our own creativity um, in response to that so for me it's a sort of birthright for everybody not without its complications but it but without it we're not fully human Thank you, David, and straight to the point as, as, as ever and beautifully articulated. Uh, and I love the idea of being inculturated. I think that's what you said. Um, and, and birthright for everyone feels absolutely apt and appropriate. And I think your references relates to your um, Radio 3 play this summer, um, which I think was called Adventures with the Painted People. people. I, I, like, I do like going back into uh, into into the past i'm very interested in the past but i'm also interested in the past the ways in which the past often reveals some of the encounters we have in the present and one of the interesting things about the painted people was it was an encounter between a roman empire and um a, a then caledonian or pictish scotland and um the roman empire was another moment where um there was great interconnectivity great mixing and merging of peoples and of cultures but also um interesting tensions around the um around what was then shared within that and what identity became within those kind of co complex questions and those are i think part of your question excuse me is what are the what are the issues we face now and i think i think one of the big issues is 
how we um, find sharedness within uh, culture whilst at the same time not losing the incredible interesting differences that that come uh, with with culture and and of course the more that our cities are uh, um, are places of, of mixing and change and the more that the world is interconnected those are questions that we're having to think about and deal with Great, thank you, David. And I, I suppose I also feel that you're, um, there's a very beautiful story of how you found that, that play, which I think was in, in, initially going to be a play and presented live and not on radio. Um, but it was through another connection with Kareen Polwart, who was a guest on our series a few weeks back, um, that introduced you to the site where you started to investigate that story. Yes, yes, she, um, Kareen lived near a hill fort uh, and in her story that she did for the Lyceum, um, um, Wind Resistance, her play, her, her solo play, she tells the story of her son being born and her son is called Arlo because Arlo is the German word for, for a fort and she was near a, this hill fort. And I, I didn't really know what a hill fort was. And one day I went running and because of her story, I went and uh, sort of looked for this fort and it was, it's really in the middle of a field in the borders does I think fort I no longer like the word fort because I think it's far too militaristic for what we don't really know what these things were but what you find when you go there is this landform which reminds me of a Charles Jenks um, landform almost this this great sort of uh, these this sort of ditch and rise in the land in a circle with incredible intervisibility to the hills all about and um, I went and I sort of stood there and I had this very very intense moment where I just became incredibly aware of um, the fact that this landform was a human creation and that some 2000 years ago, someone has had stood there and had been aware of the arrival of, um, of, um, uh, of the Roman Empire, which, was, which had, a, which had a, a, a legionary base quite nearby and, and you could see it from the fort. So that, that really became the first moment I sort of thought that there was a story to be told about the encounter between those people, but it was very much related to Corrine's own um, psychogeography. She's a she's a great psychogeographer of Scotland, and she um, she was the one who turned me on to Hillfield. So I'm going to do the elevator pitch, David, and loop that into learning, and 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 say that you've just made the most magnificent illustration of how the arts can open curiosity and in, in inquisitiveness, um, and open the door to learning, and 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 and. Now I'm going to um, move on to Leslie um, as, a, as a professor in an institute of learning um, and, and come back to the same question, if I may, Leslie, um, for you, how important is culture and creativity in today's world and why? So um, I actually want to pick up some of the things that David was saying about the, the connectedness um, and thinking back. So, so both in terms of the path dependencies that the past has brought for us and then how we might think about um, reimagining the future. Um, I love the story of this original, uh, the song line story about how we sing the world into being and how actually artistic practices are some of the part, the real key connectors between individuals and actually having an experience of art as actually an observer or as our participant is the thing that actually goes to the heart of human connectivity. One of the things that's very interesting is the criminologists that we know from criminology is it's those relational moments, those little interconnecting moments where people actually have a sort of shared experience. Those are the things that actually help people comply with the law and actually help them in terms of their flourishing and well-being. And therefore, things like if you imagine um, sitting in a theatre together and having a collective experience, something very difficult nowadays, that collective experience goes to the heart of the kinds of things that make for well-being and flourishing and compliance with rules actually so I think that's that those are really important things for me in my own research and, and things that we're trying to drive within EFI we have often used I've often used artistic practice as a means of connecting with individuals and with hard to reach groups or groups that are vulnerable in some kind of way in my research I've worked with the grass market community project and I've done a drama with people who've experienced deep social exclusion and using that drama was one way of me actually understanding much more about their own stories and storytelling as a medium for understanding connection I think is, is fundamental. So in terms of learning, um, artistic practice is, is a, a way both of 
representation. It's a way both of challenging, it's a way of transgressing, it's a way of transforming. And for me, it actually lies at the heart of nearly all the kinds of education that we want to develop, that we will have creativity as well as data and other things at the heart of our, our, our learning experiences for students. Thank you. And we're going to come on to that um, in a moment um, and explore STEAM and what that means in terms of education. But before we do that, um, I just want to reflect on the fact that we're in, we are in a period of significant change. And even before coronavirus, we were in, a, I would say, a period of significant change. And Amanda, I'm going to ask you, how, how do you perceive current trends and risks and opportunities in, in the arts and creative sectors? Um, and what do you think needs to happen in response to them? Well, first of all, can I just say thank you for giving me Brenda as the name for early woman. The, in my head, she's always just going to be called Brenda now. Um, and I, I find myself feeling slightly pretentious, as, as I do whenever Brecht comes into my mind, which is disturbingly more often than you'd think. Because as you were talking, I was thinking about the... Um, the quote about singing in the darkness and that fantastic, compelling the situation I tried to recreate in my own neighbourhood, but nobody was up for it, um, image of the Italians singing on their balconies to each other to connect. And for me, that was so heartrending and so beautifully symbolic of, of the importance of creativity and culture. And, and also, Leslie, what, what you said about um, and it is related to um, about compliance with rules and engagement with culture as, as a way of helping make that glue. Because for me, why what we what we sometimes fail to reflect adequately when we talk about the importance of culture and creativity is is the very um, prejudiced, very weighted. Uh, biasing of social capital that's embedded in certain forms of creativity and culture. Um, so social capital and compliance with the rules, that felt like there was something there for me that, that made me go, God, if we did that better, we might actually have different, different problems, different situations. Um, so I, I want to kind of keep in mind that connectedness of social capital when we give weight and preference to a certain cultural form over and above others. Um, but to the question, it is kind of related. What my, what I, oh, what I fear, my God, where do I start? Um, the trends I see are around that huge, horrid discrepancy between technological engagement, the haves and the have-nots, um, that digital and tech poverty and digital and tech being so integral to creativity as we go forward, not, not just in lockdown, but definitely at the moment we can see how we've all leaned into, we're doing it now, leaning into tech capacity to help us connect. And, and I really fear and worry about the people who aren't connected there. And I'm also relating it to the connectedness and the need for arts as a way of compliance with the rules. Um, I wish I could see the same thing that everybody else does in terms of the wonderful, um, well, no, actually I can. I can see that this has given us, that whole leaning into tech and digital has given us wonderful erasure of boundaries. Here we are talking across geographical boundaries and that's all wonderful. Um, and at the same time, at exactly the same time, I see that it's created lots of little factions. You know, I'm in a conversation with black trans dancers over there and I'm in a conversation with Asian visual artists over there and, and it's it's I'm not sure, I mean, I'm literally not sure, I'm kind of jury's out about whether it's um, cohesive or divisive or whether we are being increasingly factional and sectional or being collaborative. I'm literally not sure it's chaos. I think there is also, and that's possibly why, it plays to 
um, questions for me around neurodiverse, neurodiversity. If I'm feeling overwhelmed and I'm, I'm fairly neurotypical, I think, um, I really wonder what that feels like at the moment for people who are neurodiverse. Um, I think I've lost the thread of your question because I've got so many issues around what I think are the trends and risks and opportunities. And at the moment, I'm kind of focusing on the trends and the risks. Um, I think you're making the trends beautifully, Amanda. I think, I think, thank you. I think the other thing that I, I wonder whether this is a trend is I feel and perceive a certain tone deafness that's going on about the return to work. Um, I have lots of conversations with younger people who are having to go back to work. And at the same time, I hear senior leaders literally saying, oh, our young people are so pleased to be back in the space. And I'm like, maybe they're not, but they don't have the agency to say that they're not. And there is such a overlayering complexity of anxiety around the return that I think we don't kind of articulate very well. Um, my biggest concern is about the impact of redundancies on ethnically diverse people. That's what my business is about. But just a couple of kind of horrible data facts for you that ethnically diverse millennials are something like almost 50% more likely to be on zero hours contracts and they're four times less likely to have a permanent contract. And as we are facing redundancies, that's a real concern to me if we go back to social capital, connectivity, and what's going on at the moment. Thank you, Amanda. That's, that's a really stark statistic, uh, and I think one that we should all take account of. Suki, you had your hand up a moment ago. Um, did you want to come in on that point? Uh, thank you, and it's uh, absolutely brilliant hearing from colleagues and the, the kind of different dimensions that they bring to the discussion. I just wanted to take it down a kind of different slant and, and something that I feel is just becoming more and more apparent about those of us who believe in culture and the numbers and the population that don't. And I think that's an ism that is really, really worrying. That chasm between those who work in the sector and they, the way they voted in Brexit was just a proxy measure, I think, for a real schism between those of us who are in the sector, work in the sector, know people within the um, in the breadth of the sector, in whatever we mean by that definition, not the ECMS definition, whatever we believe to be within that gang and those that don't. And I think as we look ahead to future spending and future investment, just listening to colleagues about how beautifully they underline the importance of um, culture, creativity, artistic activity, the intrinsic value, and often it's reduced to the instrumental. It's 100 billion pounds to the economy. It's one in 10 jobs. It drives physical regeneration. That's an ant, and unfortunately, I think we are losing the argument at this moment in time, and we're not winning the argument around the importance. Otherwise, it would be embedded in our education system, and we know it's been stripped out on so many levels. Um, and I think that's a, a real, real challenge, and that's my, my, my biggest fear at this moment in time is, is how differently we see the world. And maybe that speaks to Amanda's point around how we seem to speak the same language on one moment and then on the next, we seem very uh, different. There's some real challenges, I think, for our sector. And I'm not sure we always organise ourselves in a way that's, that's helpful. Um, and I think we need diversity of views. I just think we need to think about how we speak to the publics and how we underline that it's their culture we're talking about, not someone else's, not about just the publicly funded, but about the things that people read, write, listen to, play with. That's the importance of, of this. And I think sometimes we don't quite get that right. Thank you, Suki. And um, I'm gonna, so the second part of my question, Amanda, um, earlier on what relates to what do we need to do about the trends that we're witnessing uh, and, and sensing and feeling uh, just now. And I'm going to come to Sarah uh, and ask you that big question, what do we need to do? And then on to Geoffrey uh, to bring you into the conversation after that. Sarah. 
I, I texted, thank you, Janet. I texted Janet earlier today to say that my brain was at this moment on the point of exhaustion. To, so to have opened up with a little question like, how do we, uh, how do we solve this? I think, um, I think we have to, I think we have to really start doing things really, really differently. I think we have to, I think we have to organize. I think we have to mobilize. I think we have to start really deeply listening to um, different views, different opinions. I think we need to really be much more radical with our institutions. We need to, to, to stop doing a lot of stuff and we need to start doing a lot of other stuff. And I suppose the bit that I'm really interested in or that might be useful to mention at this stage, because I think one of the real challenges in this kind of, where we're seeing this level of shift, this paradigm shift in our world, is I still have two sets of conversations. I have, sometimes I feel like we're, working, we're operating across two parallel worlds. There's the world that we physically see when we're walking down the street and there's the world that we really know is, is, is happening and beginning to, to manifest. And at that point of the sort of, I suppose, that transition, that complexity, there are people who say to me, well, if we just hold steady and get a few more, you know, cars in the car park or, you know, weddings in, in, in the building to get, generate some income and that kind of business model conversation, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to where things are. And then actually the reality is things are never going to go back. So we now need to completely radically find new ways of, of, of being relevant. So to me, at the moment, what we're focusing on at Baltic is what is it that our communities, our constituents, our audiences, our community, what do they need us to be? And our tool for that is, is art and artists. So how do we use our artists and use all that sense of creative and bring them together? But to really rethink everything is, 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 is needs to be thought differently. And I think one of the things that I find most worrying at the moment and always happens at times of deep change is this sense of people being pitted against each other. So it becomes this group against that, it's big versus small, it's one art form versus the other, it's black versus white, it's this, this, this. And actually that just falls into the culture wars, it creates division, it, but the difficult stuff is the transition, it's how do we start to map the transition? How do we collectively give something to create something that we can all focus on to work towards. And to me, it's really, I just go, right, we start off at this level with this, our house is on fire, right? Our planet is burning. So let's just start from that because you can talk about whether this festival gets money or that theater gets money and none of it is going to make any difference if, if we don't deal with net zero. So we're starting a lot of our conversations around networks and around our own organization, which is we start with how do we get to net zero? How do we create sustainability? Because that's got to be the bedrock for everything that goes forward. And we look at two brilliant things that happened under lockdown. And this isn't, this isn't in, in naive. I know there was so, there's absolutely horrific stuff and da, 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 but the two positives that I see that we build on are, an enhanced sense of community and solidarity, people collaborating, looking out for their neighbours. This was a profound shift that not just people that work and have good, you know, good neighbour type, but actually that was a profound shift that people really felt the importance of their communities. And that's something that, you know, we're now saying that's what we build on. The other real positive was, I think, what David and uh, Amanda have also an, alluded to in Leslie, which was this expanded sense of creativity and people taking part and making. So whether it was gardening, baking, drawing, knitting, you know, people were beginning to find people who don't often their lives are maybe don't give space or time. I have, have really we saw a real enhanced sense of people's participation in culture in its widest sense. So I talk to my staff here and I keep going, those are the things we build. We build the positives and then we look at the negatives. So what were the negatives? And the real obvious glaring negative is inequality. The absolute sense that some people under lockdown have paid down debt, have done very well. They've stayed at home in our nice little middle-class houses and all the people on the front line going to work, all the key workers, you know, Great friends of mine, all on the front line working in Aldi, said getting our shopping that some of us were too frightened to even go and pick up, so we got it hand delivered. So that sense of inequality 
And within that, I think the second thing that was really clear was um, inbuilt institutional racism. So where, again and again, people most likely to suffer or to be impacted by COVID, to have the worst housing, lack of access to energy, most impacted, where, like Amanda was saying very clearly, from our, our, our more diverse communities. So we, how do we reduce those inequalities and how do we build the positives? And one of the things that we've spent a bit of time doing on lockdown, which I found is we, I'm, as well as Director Baltic, I chair a thing called the Contemporary Visual Art Network. And over the lockdown period, we've been working with that network, which is a federated model, so it can listen to voices right across the country and feed it up. Um, and we've started to form, there's about six different visual arts um, networks that support very different parts of the needs of our artistic community. And we've just literally brought all of those together in a single alliance. And we're just, we literally, two meetings, everybody's agreed the frame, it's a progressive alliance, it's very clear, it's not something that's there to simply lobby for more resources to keep things as they are, but it is, it's, we're calling it a progressive alliance because it's really, it's based on shared principles of equity and in inclusion and social justice, but using the visual arts to, to get there. So the idea is we can lobby so one arm of it will be a lobbying arm, which brings together thousands of voices through the different networks. And I think one of the challenges that I see at the moment with this increasing rise of the right, increasing division um, and fracturing of our society is coming because people can't, we urgently need to build a picture of what the future looks like. And I think until we start to manifest and make that picture a reality based on, you know, I've been doing a lot of conversations recently with economists because I think arts, well, often arts and cultural workers, I think we think the economy is really difficult and complex. And I found myself having a slightly strange moment at the very start of lockdown where I originally studied um, philosophy and politics at Dundee University. And I'm really old. So when I was a student, it was just a stature was really beginning to... to come to power and the ideas on the table at that time was Hayek, Nozick, it was the, the, the free market and my entire uh, working life in the arts has gone from, you know, I was just thinking today, I started out working in community arts in Edinburgh in Pilton and Muir House, you know, at the time Edinburgh City Council had an arts development team of five or six staff you know, and over the last 20 years, what we've seen in the visual arts, and I think this is similar across a lot of different art forms, the absolute rise of, you know, financiers and the art fairs and the, you know, and it's really, I think, distorted where we need to really put our energy and our focus. So for me, uh, there's a lot of potential in this, but what we need to do in our role as leaders and I still find it quite appalling how divisive some of our leaders are on social media. And I think, so I suppose where I'm going to put my energy in a time of emergency is not shouting at people on Twitter, but is at, which is fine. I understand we need some of that. I, I think we need, we need both. But my focus is going to be on trying to galvanize people around this sort of understanding of what a circular non-extractivist economy can be. And when you start to do that, you start to really think about how artists can really play a critical role in that reimagining. So the Thank problem, you, sir. sorry. I'm, I'm going to pause there just because I want to, I know Amanda wants to come in too. Um, and I also want to bring Jeff in as well, uh, which I'm going to do first, Amanda, if that's all right with no, you. No, please bring Jeff in first because he hasn't spoken and I have. <laughs> but I just wanted to go back to something that just resonated there with me, Sarah, in, in, in all of the, um, all of the various points that you were making. And you said, we've got to stop doing stuff and, 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 and start doing a lot of different stuff. Um, 
And I suppose my question is, how do we do that? So now I'm just going to park that question for everybody, because that's the question I've been asking all of our panels right through the last 10 weeks. And nobody's given me an answer yet on how we're going to organize ourselves to be able to make that happen. So I just wanted to put that thought into everyone's heads. And I'm hoping that today we'll come up with a level of, of, of uh, contribution in terms of how we can organize ourselves around thinking around that. But Jeff, over to you. Um, it's a different question. Um, so this is really about, so you run a conservatoire. Uh, it really is about the future. It's about, um, it's about opening up the imagination to different ways of doing things. Um, it's about invention. Uh, it's about innovation. Uh, it's, it's a huge um, a place of, of talent and talent development. How can universities and academic and voc vocational institutions contribute to helping us evolve in the arts and creative industries and 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 potentially help find those solutions uh, and leslie i'm going to ask you this question in a moment too how can we how can how can we draw on the insights um, and the future thinking that goes on in academic institutions to find solutions both at a local but also at a global level well it's a it's a really interesting question and i'm struck by so many of the common threads my colleagues on this call have talked about the the, the noise the the crazy digital uh groups that are against one another the conspiracy theories that uh, abound uh the, the disbelieving of facts and you know one of the things i believe that art leads to the truth it, it is indisputable um and it represents um, the stories that we want to share and tell. And uh, among the things I was thinking, there's too much short-term thinking in society, in government, it, to the next election cycle, um, growing this number of jobs in this quarter. Uh, what are the skills we need um, in this community for the last month? Um, and one of the things arts and creative education give is a longer term sense. Um, like David, who's thinking of history, I find it helps to pull back from the coal face of all these crazy things happening now and look at a longer time horizon. Um, we, as, uh, we, we've done horrible things in this world, two world wars, um, we had a plague in 1918. Um, there, there are things that humanity has come together and pulled through and the arts have often helped. Um, I, I think one of the things a creative education gives us, and I hope the conservatoire can represent that at, at one of the highest levels, but we want all to participate in this, are agency and empathy. And I think one of the problems, one of the reasons conspiracy theories take such hold of people is they feel they're, they're lost in the pounding surf. They don't know what to grab onto, what is their focus, and they grab onto the, the nearest thing that, that makes them feel, ah, that's an answer. Um, and if you have a bit of a creative education, you, you realize that you can put some of these things together. You know yourself better, you know your strengths, your weaknesses, but you also learn to listen. Um, you, some of our acting teachers talk about your, your job is to make the person next to you look really good, not you. Um, and as a chamber musician myself, you're thinking, how can I make that voice come through and support it? When am I taking over? when that voice is flagging? What is the common direction that we're going in? We, we've forgotten how to have this empathy. Our political debates, we just shout at one another, who shouts loudest and last thinks they've won. And the idea of saying, let me hear where you're coming from, here's where I'm coming from. What is the common ground that we could work to? That's, that's how treaties were made, that's how solutions were found. And you find all of that within the arts within a great novel, within a great play, within a great symphony, within a great ballet. Um, there there are, are these stories of conflict and resolution. Um, and if we deny, if we think these are second class skills, um, luxury skills to have rather than essential skills to have, we'll, br we'll grow up a generation of uncaring, unempathetic, unlong term thinking leaders, some of whom are in power in places I know about, um, and, and, and that's kind of dangerous for society. 
Thanks, Joe. We're getting some very nice comments coming through on the Q&A, um, which is really great to see. Thank you to those of you who are commenting. I am going to open up for questions uh, in a moment. Um, we're, we're at 10 to 7, so if members of the audience do want to ask questions, um, please do start feeding them through. Um, I'll, I'll, I've got a few hands coming in, so Amanda, I'm going to come to you, and then Leslie, um, I'm just going to ask you that question about how universities can contribute, and then David after that. Amanda, thank you. So, Thank you to Sarah's point and, and to Jeffrey's. Um, that, that narrative around participation is, is about cultural democracy. We know this. And every day we also talk to people who think that they don't give the monkeys about the arts. Oh, it's not for me, it's elitist, blah, blah, blah. I know from bitter experience the cost of getting a child to conservatoire level. And it's not shy of quarter of a million pounds to, by the time someone's finished conservatoire training. And sorry, Jeffrey, you, you, you happen to be here to get the full force of my what's going on in conservatoires issue. But here's the thing. If we're talking about cultural democracy, if we're talking about participation, and if we're waiting a particular form of culture over and above others, we're going to stay exactly where we are and people are going to go, not my bag. I don't have a quarter of a million pounds to learn to play the violin. I'm going to go and make it in my bedroom. And then that becomes an othered thing. And they don't belong to the wider cohort of the diverser workforce of the arts. Now, why I mention the conservatoires is I also know that to get to that stage of excellence requires input really from about age two or three and we do not have any model in the UK that supports that learning in a fair and democratic way. We don't have the budget, we don't have the political appetite, we don't have the government engagement, we don't have the public education that it starts from there. So nobody knows that apart from the people who are already in a privileged place to know that. You talk about agency and that goes straight to the point of it. Who has the agency in that situation to participate effectively and meaningfully in the sector by the time, if by the time I'm seven, I'm too late. Now we talk about empathy and I absolutely agree with you, Jeffrey. We have lost the art of informed dissent. We just don't do that anymore. But here's the thing, you, you asked about Janet, what we need to do to do it differently. I don't think it's that difficult. I know that sounds really quite um, ballsy, but I have a provocation that I, I share with um, various arts groups and, what, and it's based, based on a 1% challenge. What would happen if all of our organisations just paid attention to each budget line and dedicated 1% of that budget line every month to an inclusive inter intervention? something an inclusive activity whether that is changing the procurement partners or going to a different organization to do your marketing or whatever it might be a one percent intervention on each budget line in a systemic and sustained way would change the inclusion narrative would change who participates in the arts would even change what we call the arts and stop all those people who feel like this is nothing to do with me i don't give a monkeys but i do listen to a lot of music and i'm on spotify all the time it would change that narrative completely that's the first thing and my other kind of big headline on what can we do differently is to embed inclusion as a condition of funding whether that's private funding or public funding if it's conditional from the outset that your organisation meets, let's call it 15%, that's less than the UK's diverse cohort, but it's doable if you're in South West England and whether you're in Central England. If you said that there was a condition of funding, whether it's public or commercial, and it had to be inclusive, you can bet your life we'd make a way to do it. We would change our mindset of what is culture, we change our mindset about the organisational culture, 
would engage with people in different ways and we go you know what suck it up it's not like me it's not how i do it but it's one percent i can manage this so that's my what to do in a nutshell thank you well, be seventy thousand pounds consultancy fee please thank you <laughs> <laughs> really clear. Uh, Leslie, coming back to you, does that chime with some of the values and, and principles that uh, you're setting up uh, at EFI in terms of social inclusion uh, and widening participation? We've just not got you on mic at the moment, that's it. Sorry, yes, I'm on mute now, sorry. Go. I think universities actually have, generally, not just EFI, universities actually have a really hugely important civic role to play. That Actually, we get our legitimacy for our, how we connect with our local communities and also with international communities too. And I think we have, as institutions, we have what we might call institutional capital, where we can provide advocacy and also voice and knowledge and use those in, in a way in a spirit of actually creating greater inclusion and greater equality. I think one of the things that's been interesting from listening to the conversations is both how the COVID emergency has led to um, opening up and understanding new forms of connection and old forms of connection and how we have kind of a sense of community activism and connectedness and yet at the same time it's leading to greater fragmentation as well. So I think there's a the, the kind of inequalities that have um, emerged and have got become exacerbated through the COVID-19 emergency are things that are things that I think universities should be trying to address. So within the Futures Institute we are very keen on developing a kind of life course approach to learning so thinking about learning over a hundred year life up to potentially um, that people will come in and out of education to enable people to have that flexibility to come in and out of education when it is helpful to them to widen participation so that we can have um, education for anyone who has the opportunity to um, to benefit from